a confession is admissible to nothing more than a charade. The admissibility or otherwise of a confession falls to be determined on the evidence placed before a court in a trial within a trial together with the admissible evidence which has gone before it. If at the end of the trial within the trial the requisites of, for admissibility have not been proved, the confession may or must be excluded. It cannot be admitted on the basis that other evidence may emerge during the course of the trial to justify its admission. Once a confession is admitted, its admission is provisional only in the sense that evidence may thereafter emerge which requires it to be excluded. Then it calls the case of R. Malazani, 1952-3-SA-639, that's 644-E, it's an AD case. The other case is S versus W, 1963, 3SA516, appellate division. And the other case is S versus Lamini, and another, 1971, 1SA807. Right, that is the law. So it mustn't be argued that this judge didn't consider the evidence regarding coercion. In other words, the synopsis of the encapsulation of the evidence, the salient features are this, that when the state intended to bring into play by introducing the so-called alleged confessions or statements of accused number one and two and the pointing out by accused number two, the defense objected. And the principal objection was that one, they did not make statements. They did not make confessions. They were told to sign documents which were fully completed, and they were told, sign here, sign there, initial here, initial there. That was the initial defense. The second defense is that they were assaulted, tortured, severely, as Mr. Gomez would put it, severely tortured, tubed, electrocuted, kicked, in order to elicit their signatures on the documents. In other words, these accused before court, their evidence is they don't know the contents of the of the confession. They don't know. They were never read to them. And if you go further, accused number one, for instance, says when he went to sign the <coughs> confession or statements before Maboto, I think. Maboto never been sat down. When Maboto came, they were assaulting him. All that group of policemen. And Maboto then called him aside and said, hey, you know what? Why don't you sign this document? These guys are going to injure you. And then, to save his life, accused number one says he signed. No discussion with Maboto in an office sitting down, according to accused number one. Accused number two also says uh, when he went to sign the alleged confession of statement before Mrs. Cronje, all he said when he got in, even before Mrs. Cronje could introduce himself, as herself as a magistrate, he came in and told Mrs. Matraping, the interpreter, that may you tell the lady please that uh, Six weeks, I haven't had a bath from the 16th of June, I think. And also that I want to speak to my daughter, I want to speak to my partner or parents. And that was it. And he sat down and looked at the ground. And Mrs. Cronje, what he did was he was busy with his computer. She never asked him anything. All she was interested in was the computer and then she would get out and gossip with a fellow magistrate or fellow white lady and come back. Mohoru was going in and out, in and out, consulting with Mrs. Cronje. Nothing was discussed between accused number one, um, number two, and Mrs. Cronje, except, as I said, that I haven't had a bath and I want to speak to my daughter and my partner. Nothing. The same applies for Rapudu. Accused number two says, no discussion with Rapudu, nothing. He was just beaten up and told to sign. So in the main, that is the salient aspects of the evidence relating to the trial within a trial. It's obvious that uh, Geninda, Maholewa, and others gave evidence. But what I want us to understand is that this court, after careful analysis of the evidence adduced by the state, and after careful analysis of the cross-examination interposed by the defense against the evidence adduced by the state, 
And after careful analysis of the rebuttal evidence of accused number one and two, and the cross-examination interposed by the state, and after careful analysis of the heads of argument by all the parties concerned, and the verbal submissions made by all the councils in this court, I have dealt, not like this magistrate did, I've dealt with all the evidence relating to whether the said alleged confessions were made freely and voluntarily in the sound and sober senses of the deponents without any force or coercion. I've dealt with all that. And I've also dealt with uh, the other primary defense by the accused, that all the accused were not apprised of their constitutional rights, meaning section 35.5 of their rights. They were not, not, never apprised according to that. And this court even also interrogated that. And as we all know, Section 35 encapsulates the concept that if any evidence is acquired through the infringement of the Bill of Rights, that evidence should not be admitted into the record of the proceedings relating to Section 17 and Section 18. Even Section 19 of the Criminal Procedure Act Right. Consequently, after going through all that evidence carefully, this court has reached the following conclusion. One, it rules that the confessions made, the confession made by accused number one was made freely and voluntarily without any coercion when accused number one was in his firm, sound, and sober senses. Two, the confession made by accused number two in respect of the said confession being taken by Mrs. Rongier, the magistrate, the court rules that it was made freely and voluntarily without any coercion when accused number two was in his full and sober senses. And also the confession made before Colonel Rapudi was also made by accused number one, two. freely and voluntarily without any coercion when he was in his sound and sober senses. And also the pointing out made by accused number two before Colonel Khadebe were also made freely and voluntarily without any coercion when accused number two was in his full and sober senses. Okay, that is the ruling. Yes, Mr. In a shocking turn of events, Judge Rata has made his ruling. I repeat, Judge Rata has made his ruling. You just listened to his entire ruling. And previously to that, he had Baloi reading um, the law and previous cases with reference to how he has got to his ruling. It is essential that we understand that the ruling is just a ruling and can be changed at any time throughout the main trial. Judge Rata has therefore ruled that the confessions were admissible and he uses the words that they are admissible because the confession of accused number one and two was made freely. I mean, in the same sentence, it's how he says it in the same sentence after saying that um, it is alleged that accused number one um, didn't even get to sit down. He was made to sign. Accused number two just walked in and said, I didn't bath. I want to speak to my daughter. And as uh, and this is speaking through the interpreter. I didn't bath in six weeks. I want to speak to my daughter. I want to speak to my parents. And then nothing else was said to the magistrate. The magistrate was going in and out to gossip with the other white lady. And then... Now, and in the same sentence, in the same breath, without missing a beat, he moves on to say admissible. How is that even possible? Is justice dead, ladies and gentlemen? What are your thoughts on today's verdict? Uh, in my previous video, I thought he would rule inadmissible. I was wrong. I stand corrected. But what else could we have expected from Judge Rata? I guess I had high hopes that he would apply the law. But here it is. Your comments down below. Thanks so much for watching. Catch you on our next upload.